Good morning, Faith Bible Church. Good to see everybody this morning. What a beautiful day. The sun's out. We have an opportunity and the privilege to serve our Savior this morning. I hope you're as excited to be here this morning as I am. We're going to start with some singing. Would you please stand? Grab your songbook. We are going to start with number 11 this morning. I love to tell the story. Number 11. Let's lift our voices for our Savior this morning. Number 11. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and His glory, of Jesus and His love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my love. This morning, is that a great story to tell or what? Amen. Are you guys excited that Jesus Christ saved your soul and that you get to share that story with everybody you cross paths with? Amen. We're going to turn now to number four. I am resolved. Number four, let's shout it out again. I am resolved no longer to linger.
ahead, say hello to each other. Bible Church. If we can have our seats, we're going to continue. So good to see everybody here this morning. Welcome. Welcome. The sun is out. It's a beautiful day. It's my kind of day. All right. All right. Welcome to our visitors. If this is your first time with us, thank you for being here at Faith Bible Church. We are glad you're here with us this morning. On the way in, if you didn't happen to grab a welcome packet from one of our greeters, we do have plenty more outside these doors in our foyer. Please take one. There's a middle card we want you to fill out. Other than that, so good to see everybody here this morning. Just some announcements for you before we continue on with our, um, with our service and hear our special here uh, very shortly. Uh, parents, please note, Kids Choir is going to be today in the middle classroom, the blue room here, at 1140 a.m., so when... Uh, Church lets out, start your fellowship, 1140, middle classroom, okay? Um, is that time of year again? If you noticed, uh, the grass is starting to grow, so uh, it's time for our lawn crew to get back together. So if you were part of our lawn crew last year, uh, I will be reaching out to you. If anybody is interested in participating in that, it's usually about a once-a-month rotation that we have going right now for the guys on the lawn team. If you're interested, let me know, see me, and uh, I'll try to get you uh, into that rotation, okay? But that's going to be starting up really soon here. I'll, I'll email you guys and let you know that. Um, this Friday, April 21st, going to be Couples Night. Uh, if you've signed up for that, that's going to be this Friday here at the church, 7 p.m. If you would like to attend that still, there is a sign-up sheet on the back table. Please go to the back table and take a look at all of our announcements and all of the upcoming events on our board. Uh, that's one of the sign-up sheets you'll see is our Couples Night with Pastor Mike Metzger. That's going to be this Friday at 7 p.m. Um, Saturday, April 22nd, teens, we are going to be doing our youth group mall scavenger hunt. Okay, so uh, that's on our teen app. But just a reminder, this Saturday, 11 a.m., we're going to meet here at the church. We're going to leave from here, go to the Eastview Mall, uh, have some lunch there at the food court, and then we're going to do our, uh, our scavenger hunt there throughout the mall. And uh, we'll, that's going to take maybe an hour to do, and then we'll be back by like three the latest, I would say, not even three. So we'll, uh, we'll keep you updated on that, parents. But that's this Saturday as well. Uh, Saturday. April 29th is going to be the next Young Adult Bible Study. That's going to be at Tom and Kate Bredo's house, 7 p.m. So if you have any questions, please see Tom or Kate or Emily Ziefla on, on, those, uh, on that day, the 29th, 7 p.m. Tuesday, May 9th, the Faith Keepers are getting back together for their mini golf event. Uh, that's going to be every second Tuesday of the month here coming up. Um, that's going to be... Uh, uh, there should be a sign-up coming soon for that. Uh, but if you have any questions, please see Jeannie Kern. That's a fun time, good time of fellowship. That's starting Tuesday, May 9th. Okay, just jot that down. Uh, and then lastly, uh, ushers, come on forward. Tuesday, May 16th. Men, we've had a great, I know, what's this, our sixth, seventh year now for our golf league. Men's FBC Golf League is starting up again. 
Uh, our first day is going to be Tuesday, May 16th. We bumped it up a week this year um, so we can... Um, so we can uh, skip the 4th of July because that's on a Tuesday this year as well. So we're going to start a week earlier, Tuesday, May 16th. It is $100. It is 10 weeks of golf. And then obviously if you want a cart, you can pay extra for that. But that's going to be at Southern Meadows Golf Club uh, in Rush over here. Uh, so if you have any questions, please see me. Next week there will be a sign-up sheet. So if you're interested, uh, any men interested in uh, doing the golf league, please uh, look for that sign-up sheet next week. Sunday that'll be out there for us. My goal is 20. We had about 18 last year. I want 20 this year. So we'll see who we can find. I'm, I'm pretty sure we can get that. So, all right, we're going to have uh, Steve pray for the offering and then we'll hear our special. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And Lord, we pray that you'd bless this portion of the worship service. We pray that you'd uh, multiply uh, these ties for your honor and glory. And uh, Lord, we think of the preaching hour to come that you'd hide our pastor behind the cross. Lord, that you might quicken our ears and open our eyes, that we might behold wonderful things out of thy word. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Riley. Riley, such a simple piece. Thank you. I don't, I'm so thankful, Riley, really, I mean this. Thank you for what you do up here. I appreciate you. It's a beautiful thing that you do for the Lord. I'm thankful, Gail, for you guys. Um, these two ladies do a tremendous amount in the music ministry. And uh, Riley, um, you know, she threatens to beat me up. You guys don't know that, but she'll, she'll hurt me if anything goes wrong up here. So um, I'm appreciative of these ladies, and thank you for using your talents for the Lord. Um, we have an opportunity one more time before the pastor comes, and uh, I don't know about you, but when I see the sun shining in the morning, I get excited when I get to wake up and go to church and know that Jesus saves. I'm so thankful to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so you know what? We're going to sing about that this morning. Would you grab your songbook? We're going to turn to number 38, Jesus Saves. Let's shout it out one time this morning before the pastor comes. Number 38.
singing this morning. You may be seated. Amen. That's some good, loud singing for the Lord and playing. Don't these folks up here do a great job, though? The instrumentals and they week in and week out. Appreciate that. And uh, thank you, Gal, for the special and Riley. That was beautiful. You guys did a great job. We appreciate that. All right. Well, good to see you. Jesus does save, right? So it's all about right there. Hey, what's life all about? Jesus saves. All right. So uh, we had a great week last week. Speaking of that, uh, Resurrection Sunday. There, there. I know that there were quite a few lost people in here, and I know that they got a thorough gospel. Okay. Now we need to pray. I didn't hear of any professions. Uh, ten books, ten ultimate question booklets went home with somebody. Um, so just continue to pray for a harvest. Now, I'm also not silly enough to believe that every person in this room is born again. Okay, By percentages, they're just not going to be. So, And I know, I'm pretty sure that there are some that have not made a profession of faith or come to Christ. And again, I just appeal to you, if that's you if, you, if you can't go back to a time or a place, circumstance, when you ask Jesus Christ to save your soul, you would know if you did, and that you've put your complete faith and trust in him, uh, then you need to take care of that. This is just a little postscript, uh, uh, you know, from last week. You, you, need to, you need to take care of that. That's a very serious thing, okay? So if you died right now, you want to know for sure that you'll be in heaven uh, when you die. So, And an, on another positive note, I think we had our highest attendance ever. We had 320 people in church last week, uh, which is great, more than last year. And uh, um, so anyway, it was just a great day through and through. So um, let's see, yesterday was a busy day too. Um, uh, the Iwana Grand Prix went very well. Uh, thank you. Mike and your team and Frank Mantisi and a lot of the folks, but we had 44 kids race their cars yesterday. Tom and one of them. Didn't you win something, Tom? He got second. So the, you know, you these real little kids, oh, the, the baby has a car. Uh, the baby built the car? You know what I mean? So it's just all fun. The dads are there. The dads are over there. Yeah, yeah, sweetheart, you did good. Yeah, yeah. So, but... Uh, it was a lot of fun to watch. It was like organized chaos. It really was organized, but what a, what a great time, fun for families and everybody. It was just a blessing to watch, so great job, everybody. Uh, last night, the young adults uh, had a, a tie-dye uh, evening to do some shirts and other things. That was interesting uh, to watch as well, so I've never seen that done before, but that was interesting. It reminded me of when they dye my hair. I don't know. They, were, they had the squirt bottles out and all that other stuff, so... But anyway, it was, it was fun to watch uh, that as well. So it was a great weekend this morning, adult Sunday school, 65 people in class. Uh, Pete did a great job there on the judges, and we'll do that five more weeks. Next week, we'll talk about the start of the Kings, okay? So take you through the rest of the Old Testament. You're more than welcome to attend that. That's at 830 uh, for the next five Sundays. So Dave hit all the announcements. This will be the last chance to sign up for the couples night if you're coming. I think we have around 60 people coming Friday night. So we'll start at 6 o'clock. It'll be a catered dinner um, that, uh, that you know will be delicious because it'll be our old friend Pat Marcanio who always does our catering. Uh, leave it to us catering. And um, then it'll always, it's always a great message uh, from Pastor Mike um, geared toward relationships towards couples. So um, anyway, if you want to come, just need you to sign up uh, for that. Um, the cleaning day, it was going to be the Compass Care Walk for Life, May 6th. They have canceled that in that format, all right? So if you still would like to uh, get sponsored and do your own Walk for Life, you can do your own individual Walk for Life, and uh, I would suggest that if you raised money in the past for that. Maybe you would want to just, just designate that to Compass Care. We'll give them our normal, you know, $1,500 that we give them every year. Um, but anyway, since that venue is canceled, we are going to have the cleaning day 
that day. It'll be men's prayer meeting at 8. It'll be the cleaning uh, day at 10 a.m. if you can help to sign up. But it'll, you, know, you don't have to come here all day. If you could just come for a little bit, an hour, a couple hours, whatever it is, uh, we kind of go through the whole property. And I, I think we're going to need this year, if anyone, if any of you guys have a chainsaw but also know how to safely operate one, <laughs> all right, that's the key. We're going to need some stuff uh, sawed down. No, no, son, no, no. Not, not in the least bit. So you're still learning to ride a bike, so you're not, you're, you're not, you're not, getting, you're not getting a chainsaw, J-Mac. No way. So uh, Mother's Day um, breakfast. Save the date, ladies. We'll have a sign-up sheet next week. Uh, it's Saturday, May 13th. Saturday, May 13th at 9 a.m., just like we did last year. Mother's Day uh, breakfast, okay? And then uh, what else did I have? Um, just that if you want to be on the 50 and over faith keepers email, if you would like, they put together a very nice, uh, publishing newsletter, um, Michelle Feathers. Michelle, just, do you stand for a second? You need to see this woman right here, uh, stand, dad, a girl, she, that, right there, all right, if, if, if you want to be on the email list, and that'll give you all the dates for the mini golfing and all, all the things coming up, Okay. So, all right, that, I think that's everything. So, uh, Mark chapter 12 this morning. Mark chapter 12. We've come down to verse 28. I'm going to read here 28 to 31 and then have our prayer together. Mark 12, 28. It says, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Thank you, Lord. Father, we pray and uh, just now as you'd open our eyes, as was prayed earlier, uh, to behold wondrous things, God, uh, out of the passage and just pray your blessing as we learn the commands that you have prioritized uh, for your believers. Now we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now you remember in review, uh, the Pharisees tried to catch him in his words, the mental, uh, the, the mind warfare, the mental warfare, uh, you know, uh, is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Then we had uh, the Sadducees come and say, there's no resurrection, and what happens in this scenario? And then he put them down and basically said, uh, you do error, uh, not knowing the scripture. And so after these, here come the scribes. This is another little grilling of Jesus, uh, this time from a scribe. The scribes were the keepers of the law. They're holders of the law, all right? And the Jews had come up with it. This time, the Jews had come up with more than six hundred commandments of God. Can you imagine that? I mean, anything from washing your hands to pots and pans to just every little thing, every little tiny thing. So he comes up out of 600 different commands, prompting him to ask Jesus, well, which is the greatest of the commands? And Jesus' response is brilliant as usual because he summarizes the law into two commandments. Loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. That's the same pattern that we see in the moral law. When he, he broke down, he gave the Ten Commandments, right? The Ten Commandments is the same pattern because the first four are toward God and the last six are towards man. So you, you have the first four, right? No other gods before me, no graven images, not taking the Lord's name in vain, 
Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. All right, that was all towards upward towards God. Then the last six, you have honor thy father and thy mother. You have uh, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And the tenth is thou shalt not covet. The neighbor's wife and the neighbor's house, etc. So again, you see this when he says in this passage, when they say, what's the grace? He says, first of all, first of all, the Lord our God is one Lord. Because that's the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, right? And then he concludes it with loving your neighbor as yourself. That's the tenth commandment. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thy neighbor's wife. So you can just see the brilliance here, can't you? When, when you break this down with... with with Christ, how he summarized it. So I want to break down his summary of these commandments. He says, first of all, the commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. In other words, you, we are to love the Lord emotionally, spiritually, mentally, and physically, or with our whole being, all of us, every part of us, should love the Lord our God. With our heart means he is always on our heart. He fills our heart. We love him. We feel like we love him. We know he loves us. The heart is the seat of the emotions, and our emotions are to belong to him. Listen to me now. Your heart and your emotions don't belong to your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Your heart and your emotions don't belong to other people. They belong to God first and foremost. That's loving him with all your heart. Sometimes young ladies sometimes give their heart away. Listen, young ladies, your heart belongs to God. Your heart belongs to your dad. And then at some point, done well and done right, it belongs to your husband, okay? But you have to do that decently and in order. Young men, the same thing for your, for your future wives, okay? So, uh, you know, loving God with, with our heart. Our emotions become more stable because he's in charge of them. Loving him makes our heart firm and established, I was talking to Gisela yesterday, Gisela Ford. She's going to be turning 80 pretty soon, which is just so hard to believe. I said, I can't believe that. I said, you look so good. I said, God has blessed you with a great countenance, with great health, with all those things. Because I know it's because you serve him and you love him. And she said, she said he is my everything. He is my heart. Perfect. Thank you for that. I'm going to use it tomorrow, I said. <laughs> right? But that's so true. Loving God with all, with, with all your heart, those emotions, and being established and being firm with those. Um, with our soul, our soul, that's our inner man. That's our spiritual man. Um, Jesus said... We worship God in spirit and truth. That means, you know, the inner part of us needs to worship him and love him. I can love someone or something in the flesh. Oh, I love them. Oh, I love you. Oh, I love the, you know, in the flesh is one thing. But in, the, in my spirit is completely different. With God, we love him with our soul. We love him spiritually, our inner man. Um, it's important. That you love him uh, right down to your very core, right down to your very being, that you love Jesus Christ. Our mind, he says with our mind, our mind is also a spiritual thing. We love him mentally, mentally. You know what that brings? More stability to you. When you love him with all your mind, more stability for you. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, you ought to know this verse. You ought to know where this verse is. You ought to memorize this verse. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. 
God will keep us in perfect peace when our mind is stayed on him. Loving him with our mind. He's in your thoughts. He's your focal point. It means that you trust in him. And this in turn gives us peace. In fact, not just peace, but perfect peace. If you desire perfect peace in your life, put your mind on Jesus Christ and leave it there. Perfect peace. Leave it there. He, when we love him with all our mind, he stabilizes our mind, our mental health, our well being. I'm sure you understand this, that our, uh, our country, I'll just speak for our country, is in a mental health crisis like never before. And remember, mental health is, is, is the, from the mind. It's from the mind. 21% of adults are experiencing a mental illness. That's a lot of people. That's equivalent to over 50 million Americans. It's a lot of people. 15% of adults have had this, by the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it like they have it. A substance use disorder in the past year. All right, that's nice. A substance use disorder. Substance abuse. Okay? Uh, sinful. Sinful habits. 15%. And 93.5% of those did not receive treatment. The percentage of adults reporting serious thoughts of suicide, it comes out to over 12 million adults. Serious thoughts of suicide. 11% of adults who identify with two or more races reported serious thoughts of suicide. Now why would that be? They don't, they're having a problem with their identity when all along God says to everybody, I don't care what your race is or how many mixes of race you have, I'm your identity. Your identity is in Christ. That's what they're missing. That's what they're missing. More than 2.7 million youth are experiencing severe major depression. 16% of youth report suffering from at least one major depressive episode in the past year. 55% of adults with a mental illness receive no treatment. Over 28 million individuals. It's a mental health crisis. You see that? It's a crisis. And they're not getting help. And they're out there trying to deal with it themselves. And folks, listen. Listen. Uh, is I can speak for the Christians. I, thou shalt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Fill your mind, believer, fill your mind with the word of God and keep your mind on him. You will love him, you will trust him, and he will give you perfect peace. He'll give you perfect peace. It's a, the, the mind is the battleground for the Christian. It's, it's a spiritual warfare. But we need to understand that we are to love God emotionally, spiritually, and mentally. This is the thing you have to feel. You have to love God mentally as well. All right? You've got to let him, let God captivate your mind. Don't let all this other nonsense captivate your mind. See, listen, everyone starts out, and I understand we all come from different demographics and, and, and all that, but everyone starts out, uh, you're born and you're a child and you have a pure mind and you grow up and it's decisions that are made either for us or that we make where this other stuff just permeates and penetrates us. Okay? You have control over what you do, adults. You have control over that. You need to get your mind stayed on Christ. When we love him first, the last thing is that we love him with all of our strength. That's everything. Again, encompasses everything. But even our physical strength, 
And that will happen. When you love the Lord, you're going to be running for him, doing things for him, exerting energy for him. You're going to spend yourself for him. You're, you're going to physically go for him. You're going to sacrifice, as the Bible says, present your bodies a living sacrifice for him. That's all true. The Apostle Paul wrote, I will uh, gladly spend and be spent for you, is what he said. That's a physical exhaustion as well. That's loving God with all your strength. You love him and it will wear you out some. But I always said this, it's better to be worn out for Jesus Christ than for other people. It's better to be worn out for the gospel than some financial gain, the world's pleasures. If I'm going to be worn out, it's going to be for Christ's sake. That ought to be loving God with all your strength. We love him, he says, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, physically. That's how you ought to love God. Listen, if you're struggling today with things, you're struggling with your walk, you're struggling with, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, spiritually or anything, folks, remember what he's called us to do. He wants us to love him. With all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Not just some of it. When you do that, the returns are the blessing. It's you, you and I cannot have a mediocre spiritual walk with Christ and expect to be stable. Not in this environment. Not in the world we live in. You have to step up your spiritual game, in other words. You think the heat is being turned on now by the world, the flesh, and the devil? You think it's being turned up a little bit for us? It is. The warfare is intense right now. The warfare is intense. Yesterday, in the town of, of all towns, Pittsford, New York. Muffy, darling, we're from Pittsburgh. Of all towns, sorry, Bud, Pam, sorry. Um, <laughs> one of their bookstores hosted a transgender book reading for children. And it was on the news, and it was on the news, and the support for those people was unbelievable. The support. Do you see what's happening? You better step it up spiritually. You better step it up spiritually because pretty soon, pretty soon, we'll be, some of us will be the last ones standing against things like this. And you're going to have to be strong to endure it. Love God emotionally, spiritually, mentally, and physically. That's what he says here. The second thing he says in our passage is, and love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, this is how I want to summarize this. A lot of people will be, and right, so love God and, and love others. Love God, love your neighbor. So this is what I want to emphasize on this. Loving yourself is second to loving God. You hear what I said there? Loving yourself is second. That wasn't the first one. That wasn't the first one. So not only do we love God with our whole being, we also see loving yourself is, is after that. Love your neighbor as yourself. We are to still love them, still to love yourself, but not as much as we love the Lord. They're not equal commands. You don't love yourself as much as you love the Lord. You're going to be in trouble if you do that. You don't love others as much as you love the Lord. You're going to be in competition if you do that. It's a good reminder that we are second. Others are before us, but after God still. People don't have a problem loving themselves. Have you never noticed that? People don't have a problem loving themselves. They have a problem loving God, and then they have a problem loving others. It's, it usually goes in reverse order. It usually goes... Uh, uh, People love themselves first, others second, 
and God last. Completely different order. Why do we love ourselves? What's special about us? <laughs> we love ourselves so much. The Bible says no man has yet, ever yet hated his own flesh. And it comes down to the flesh. When we walk in the flesh, we're not very spiritual. When we don't hate our flesh, we don't hate sin. Loving ourselves leads to pride, and pride causes us to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. And the Bible warns us not to think of ourselves more highly than we, thought, than we ought. And then only by pride cometh contention and a haughty spirit that loves ourselves. And then finally, a fall. God will humble the proud and he exalts the humble. Instead of loving yourself, humble yourself. We love ourselves and we get so prideful. Uh, you can't talk to me like that. What? You can talk to me any way you want, really. I can't control it. You can't talk to me that way. You can't treat me like that. You can't do that to me. And you know what else we do? We love ourselves unhealthily. God, how could you do this to me? That's loving ourselves, folks. There's something wrong with that picture. God, I'm mad at you. I can't believe you did. What? <laughs> what did you just say? You're arguing with God? I, people sometimes do that like in this book. And to me, God and I, we had, a, we had a conversation. Well, let me just explain something to you. That was a one-sided conversation. <laughs> you know how I have to have a conversation and debate with God. That's loving yourself a little bit too much. That's what that is. We live in this society. Uh, we, we live in the society of loving ourselves. Listen, when I see the up-close selfies that some of you put on your Facebook, it doesn't look good, I'm just telling you. <laughs> look at me. Yeah, I see the wrinkles. And I... I, I I, I see all that. You know, you know some, some put it on there, and it's like, uh, like, and then they're waiting for it. They put it on, oh, you're so pretty. Oh, you're beautiful. You, be, you might be beautiful on the inside. All right? But what happens is, what happens is, you love yourself. That's why we're in a selfie environment. Yeah, selfies. Selfishness. You love yourself. You love yourself. I don't know about you. When I look in the mirror, I'm like, "What is? What has happened? To, what has happened to me?" There's. Listen. And again, some of you are probably not going to like this, but listen. There, there's this woke culture. It's unrealistic. The woke culture. Love yourself just the way you are. And there's this obese woman comes out singing and dancing for a Jardian's diabetes commercial. You know why you have diabetes, right? What are we doing? We're celebrating this stuff because we love ourselves. Put it in perspective. And, and, and I only say that because, listen, I'm not the poster boy for good health. And I'm not going to pretend to be either. I don't love myself that much. We humble ourselves before God. James 4, 6. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace Unto the humble, the humble. Don't love yourself unhealthily. James 4.10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. He shall lift you up. When we humble ourselves in the sight of God, he gives us the grace, and he lifts us up. Humility loves God first, and yourself 
Second, love God and you will be confident enough to love yourself the right way, not in the flesh, but in the Lord. That's how you love yourself. You'll have the right perspective on yourself. You won't, listen, you won't hate yourself. You won't love yourself in the flesh. I want to love God. I love God. He loves me, and I'm going to love myself correctly. I'm not saying to people, don't love yourself. I'm saying you love yourself after you love God with all of your being. Then you can love yourself. But if you do, if you do in a reverse order, it's, it's a, it's, you think more highly of yourself than you ought. You know, years ago, when I first got saved, there was this guy in the church, and he had a beautiful wife, and he was kind of well-known in the church. And, uh, but I always thought that they were so stuck up. I'm like, these people can't, don't even look at people. They just have their nose up in the air. and they're, I'm like, that's just weird. They were just so stuck up. And, and we had, back then, we had this golf league. And uh, this guy ran this golf league. And again, just, <laughs> it was all about him. He was just so arrogant. And one day he says to, I hung around with the up-and-coming, I guess, preachers. Everybody is in, I hung out with is in the ministry now. And we were playing, and one time he goes to one of the guys who's pastored now for 30 years or so, and, and he, there were these ladies walking by on the golf course, and he turns and he says, hey, he goes, I'd like to, I'd like to follow them around. And the guy said, um, I don't look at hamburger when I have prime rib at home. And I never, ever forgot that, right? Juicy prime rib over there, lady? Yeah, so. <laughs> I never forgot that. We got in the, we got, we all drove together. We, we, we left uh, the golf course, and there was a missionary, a guy, a guy who's a missionary, now veteran missionary, veteran pastor, myself. And we were like, can you believe the arrogance of this guy? Can you believe how prideful and how much he loves himself? Fast forward a few years. His wife leaves him. Family breaks up. He says, what have I done? What am I going to do? And he got his nose back in the Bible. He got himself back in church. And a few years later, after this event, we were all at this leadership-type meeting. He earned his way back into that. And I, just being a young jerk that I was, went up to him in the hallway before the meeting and said, <laughs> yeah. Hey, man, you've been out in retirement. Where you been? You back from retirement now? And he went just like this. He goes, put his head down and goes, yeah. And then I felt really bad after that. His humility showed. And he became a big part of the ministry. Rebuilt his life. You know Why? One time he loved himself. Then he turned his attention to God. And then he got right with God. And he humbled himself with God. And God gave him grace. God gave him grace and lifted him up. Lifted him up. He's a great Christian man. He's a great Christian man. And that, that, was, that was, you know, some, uh, some close to now, probably close to 30 years now, I bet. That happened. Humility loves God first. Love yourself after you love God. Loving myself second to the Lord is as simple as putting him first in all that I do. You put, we need to put him first in all that we do. Just as parents, grandparents, you understand this. Just as you might put your kids and grandkids first, Give yourself for them, live life around them, spoil them, 
be obsessed with them. This is what we are actually to do for the Lord. Remember, he is a jealous God. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. He's second to none. We put him first. We give ourselves to him. We live life around him. We come, become healthily obsessed with him. Loving yourself is second to loving God. Him first, then me, and then I'll have a healthy perspective toward loving others. That's how this works. That's how this works, folks. But loving yourself is second to God. Loving others is second to God. Love him first and foremost. Listen, folks, I'm going to tell you right now, because I've seen this play over and over. If you ask him for something and he blesses you with it, don't use it to walk away from him. Lord, could you increase my career? Lord, could you give me a better job? Lord, could you give us more money? Lord, could you give us this house? Lord, could you? Great, he does. He answers the prayer. Don't wedge it between you and the Lord now. And make, be obsessed with that and walk away from him. Lord, could you, Lord, would you bless us with a child? Lord, would you give us a baby? Lord, would you bless? Sure. You know how many times I've seen the birth of a child take people out of church and out of ministry? Isn't that kind of strange that you would ask God to bless you? And then you... Don't move forward in your walk. You move backward. That doesn't make any sense. God first. God first. Lastly, I want you to see this. When you love yourself properly, you will love your neighbor. You will love your neighbor. We love God first with all of our being. We can love ourselves properly after that. And when we love ourselves properly, we will love our neighbor as ourself. That's what Jesus commands. Love your neighbor as yourself. When we're stable enough to love ourselves in a healthy way, we can love others the same way, a healthy way. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us, right? That's why we love him, because he first loved us. We love ourselves healthily because he loves us. If, listen, if you're struggling with loving yourself, really, honestly, if Jesus loves you, you can love you too. That's a godly love that flows down to others. Now, people who don't love themselves, there are people who don't love themselves in a healthy way. There's those, we talked about those that are arrogant and love themselves too much. Then there's people who don't love themselves. The people who don't love themselves don't love others. They're hard on themselves, therefore they're hard on others. They hate themselves, therefore they hate others. All of that trickles down. Loving our neighbor as ourself assumes a good love and a healthy love. It's treating them well, it's looking out for them. In fact, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus said this same thing. To love the Lord thy God, while the heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself. There was a certain lawyer there, the Bible says in Luke 10, and a certain lawyer trying to get around it, knowing he fell short of it, said, uh, yeah, uh, well, who's my neighbor? That was his response. You know, hey, love the neighbor as yourself. Th th this guy, because he knew he was not doing well with this, he questioned Jesus on the command to love, your neighbor. Well, who's my neighbor? That's when Jesus answered with the story of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan came upon a man, a man who was robbed and beaten in the street and left for dead. And along came a priest, somebody of status. The priest said, it's a Samaritan. Samaritans to to Jews were like half breeds. They were dogs to the Jews. They're like, mm, 
The priest said, no. The Levite comes along, same thing. I don't see it. I don't know. I don't know nothing. I don't see it. Uh, a Samaritan comes along, the, the half-breed, the dog, the ones despised. The Samaritan comes along and helps this guy. And this is Jesus is answering, who's my neighbor? I'm going to tell you a story about who your neighbor is. And in Luke chapter 10, verse 33, it says, But a certain Samaritan, not a Jew, not a priest, not a Levite, not God's chosen, not God's called, a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. That's some special love toward people, isn't it? To see people that were, you know, uh, that were not, well, I, I'm a Samaritan. I know these people don't like me. They hate me, but I'm going to go in anyway. This is the one who Jesus said was the man's neighbor. This is the guy. So love your neighbor as yourself. What do we learn? The, the victim was a stranger, but the Samaritan had compassion on him. He went and took care of him physically. It cost him time. It cost him money. It cost him resources. But he still did it anyway. I suspect that Tom and Kate are fostering children because of the love of Jesus Christ. I would suspect that to be their motive. That's a tough thing to do. And they're doing it well. And others have done that. Thank you for your example. He took care of this stranger like he would have taken care of himself. Loving your neighbor is simply caring about people and having compassion on them, according to Jesus. When you see somebody with a need, you help them. That's loving your neighbor. It's all about a perspective. Do you love the Lord and do you love yourself? And if you do, do you see the value in his creation, how he sees the value in his creation? When you do, you'll act upon it. You'll act upon it. A friend of mine who just got back uh, from being away for the winter, he told me that he, 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 had, he was telling me that uh, in February... His sister passed away, and he's he. This guy is 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 around, probably around eighty years old. His sister was in her, her 70s, and then his brother. A month later, his brother unexpectedly passed away, and that was tough on him. Within a month, he lost two siblings, and he was telling me he went to church, and he walked into church. And was greeted by a woman pastor, and she said, how are you? He said, I've had a bad week, and my brother just passed away. And he said, she went, oh, man, that's the third one I've heard about this week. Walked away. He said, I just stood there. I couldn't believe it. He goes, I wanted a hug. I wanted prayer. So the next week, he said, not going back to that church. Tries another church the next week, goes into the church, and the pastor says, how are you? Well, I've had a bad couple weeks here. My brother passed away unexpectedly, my sister. And he said, he said, the man said, come here, give me, let me hug you. And he gave him a hug, and he prayed with him. Exactly what he wanted. You know what he had? Compassion. Listen, folks, here's the lesson because I have to learn it too. In the busyness of life and even in the busyness of ministry, and somebody says, Pastor, this, Pastor, that, and your head is spinning. There's times where you could go, uh huh, uh huh, oh, okay, yeah, uh huh, uh huh. Listen, listen. Compassion is the Good Samaritan. 
unexpectedly, I'm sure he had a busy day on a journey, unexpectedly comes upon a man left for dead and didn't say, I just don't have time to deal with this. I'm sure he didn't. I can't spend money on this. I don't want to I didn't expect to spend money on this. But he had compassion on him. Jesus says, this man was his neighbor. That's the lesson for us. People come to you with problems. People come to you with issues. People, yeah, we all have those things. But if they're coming to you, <laughs> uh, you know, it, listen, it should be, no matter what's going on in my head and a million other things, it should be, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. Let me pray with you. Can I pray with you right now? Can I do that? All right. And uh, what else? What can I do for you? You have to focus in. You have to focus in. Who's my neighbor? you got to focus in on people. Like the Lord would focus in. You wouldn't want to be like praying to the Lord like we do. Lord, you know this and you know that. And God, I need your help with this. And Father, could you please send this along and do this. You wouldn't want him going, oh, that's the seventh billion one this week. <laughs> you wouldn't want that. That's not what he does. That's not what we should do. It's the perspective we need to have. And listen, I want to, you understand this. I love my neighbor because I love God. Remember the order, right? I love my neighbor because I love God. I don't love God because I love my neighbor. Do you understand what I'm saying or no? Loving my neighbor doesn't make me love God. That's, that would be like a religious social gospel. Some of the religions, Christian, what they call Christian religions, are like this. Social gospel. You know what they do? Oh, we send missionaries. You do? What do the missionaries do over there? Well, they dig wells, and they feed the hungry, and they put clothes on their back, and they help, the, and they do this, and they do that. And sometimes I don't hear about the gospel being preached. It's called the social gospel. You know what they're trying to do in those systems? They're trying to get to God by going through helping man. That's not what happens. You get to God in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and you put him first and the priority of the message of the gospel, that causes you to go to others. And that's why you're going. That's the whole motive of it. Don't get those two flip-flopped, mixed up. It's the same thing about who do we love most, who do we love first. It's so close, yet so far. We, got, we put God first. Love God. You'll learn to love yourself. Love others. Love others. God first. And I, I fear that today, and again, Christianity is trendy. I've said this a lot. A lot of churches lately have this, that slogan because it's trendy. And it's simply, I love God and love others. Okay, that's fine when you do it like this. It should be really, if I'm going to narrow it down, I would just be, love God with all that heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because everything else comes after that. That should be the priority. Which is the greatest command according to Jesus? First, he says, first of all, first of all, you love God. How? Emotionally, spiritually, mentally, physically, with everything you've got. You keep him in your heart, you keep him on your, you keep him on your mind, you keep your mind on him. That brings us stability. We need the stability today. You love yourself after you love God. Remember, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Humble yourself before God. He will give you grace. He will lift you up. And then I can love my neighbor properly. I want to be a good Samaritan. I want to have compassion just as Christ taught us to have. That's something 
that we ought to have as believers. I know it can be difficult in this day and age. I know we can be frustrated with all of the wickedness and with all of the sin and with all of the uh, thievery and uh, all of the sexual sin and all of the uh, 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 gender confusion. And I know that that stuff can get us mad. I know that can get us to be in a vengeful mood. But listen, I want to leave that for God. And let me just love him first. Have a healthy love toward myself. And then I believe it will flow properly to other people. That's what Jesus is saying here. When they tried to trick him, he was like, this, this is a no-brainer. I can tell you exactly what we need to do. And it starts with, folks, listen, I'm a Christian, this is where I have to challenge you first. I don't, I'm not going to challenge you on how you treat your neighbor and others and yourself. That's the easy part. What I'm going to challenge you is, do you love the Lord your God with all of your heart? With all of your soul? With all of your mind? And with all of your strength. That's where we need to start. Everything else after that will take care of itself. But let's focus on him first and foremost. Father in heaven, we thank you for this command. We thank you for this reminder. We thank you for uh, all of the law being hung on these two commands. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us each, whichever ones we struggle with the most, Lord, you'd, you would speak to us. You would help us to put uh, all of our love toward you first and foremost and get that straightened out. And those that have God, maybe they do struggle with loving themselves. I pray you'd give them a better perspective. Maybe they struggle with loving their neighbor. I pray you'd give us the better perspective on those things, Lord, and teach us that we might be well balanced. Do these things according to your will. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I'll stand. Please grab your songbook and turn with me to number 54. The Old Rugged Cross, number 54.
dancing and Brother Bob Dijak, will you close us? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for the message today, Lord. Help us, Lord, to put you first in all that we say and do, think, and just help us, Lord, to be the person that we need to be to show your love to others. We ask, Lord, now that you would bless our uh, fellowship, bless our uh, safety as we go forward to our homes. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.